Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze a recording that was released featuring Johnny Depp and Amber Hurt. So this recording was made in 2015. Of course, Johnny Depp and Amber Hurt were married in 2015. They divorced in 2017. The recording is significant for a few reasons, and I'll cover some of those here in this video. Now, as I go through this video, I'm going to refer to Johnny Depp as just Depp, it's just easier to say, and Amber Heard as Amber, right? Which is inconsistent because I'm going from a last name to a first name, but Amber Heard's last name is a verb. So if I was going to say something like Heard, Heard, right? You have the name and then the verb doesn't sound right. So I'm just going to say Amber, just easier as well, right? So Depp and Amber. So as I mentioned, this recording was made in 2015. It's now public. And at the end of this recording, it does appear like both Amber and Depp knew the recording was being made. So Amber made the recording, but they both understood that they were being recorded. It's not really clear why she made the recording, although the fallout from the recording, I think, is pretty clear. But I'll talk about that again as I move through this. So a few important things here for this video. Of course, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are real people. So I'm not diagnosing anybody here. I'm not diagnosing them or anyone else. Only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. Now, this particular recording is interesting, but it certainly doesn't capture the totality of someone's personality or of the relationship between people. Also, it doesn't provide context what happened right before the recording, what happened after it, is something omitted from the recording, was the recording modified in some way, were the two acting, or was one of them acting? They are, after all, both actors, so that's a possibility. So again, this audio recording just offers a small and perhaps distorted view of a much larger picture that we cannot see. So I listened to the entire recording. Some of the sections I listened to more than once I'll go through some of the key statements that came up in the recording, and I'll give my thoughts on the situation. So looking at some of those statements, and I'm mostly doing this in a chronological format from the beginning of the recording to the end. So early on, we hear that Amber says, you can't run away from every fight. It's easy. It's not brave. It's not strong. So she's talking to Depp, and she's saying essentially that when things get heated, when they start arguing, he leaves the room or goes away somewhere, and she doesn't like that. She said it's harder to say to somebody, I want to work this out. I want to face what I have. Now, this is pretty typical in a dysfunctional or destructive relationship, and we see this theme throughout the entire recording. It's like saying, by dodging my aggression, by not submitting to my abuse, by running away from a fight, you're denying me my feelings, right? This is, again, something I've heard many times. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard this, in a critical setting, I would have a sufficient quantity of nickels, right? I'd have, I'd have a lot more than I need. All right. So later on in the recording, we hear, you're lazy, you're cowardly. And then Depp responds, what do you need me for? Right? Clearly feeling insulted by those statements. And Amber says she wants him to fight for the relationship. This occurs many times, the statement that she makes. So it would seem perhaps there's a sense of insecurity and that does seem to be a main focus of this argument, at least on the part of Amber. She's struggling to feel secure in the marriage and perhaps doesn't see how her own aggressive behavior might be hurting that relationship. Now, right after this fight for the relationship part, we see Depp say, with the guy you don't like, so referring to himself. So kind of pointing out that she's insulting him and also saying she wants to be with him. And this, of course, is something that causes pain, right? We see he's hurt by this. Not only hurt by the physical attacks that we learn about in a few minutes, but the verbal attacks as well. So then we see this interesting statement that Amber married for security and safety, and it seems like maybe Depp did too. It's not really perfectly clear from the recording. I found that to be interesting, right? Nothing says, I love you as much as, hey, I married you for safety and security. Who doesn't want to get married for those reasons? The interesting thing is I actually hear this a lot. Many people view marriage as a stable and safe environment. And of course, for many people it is, but it's not for everybody. 
There are a number of reasons to get married. Safety and security are not among those reasons. So perhaps this was a situation where there were less than realistic expectations kind of going into it. In a sense, I think what's missing here, and I see missing often when working with couples who are married, is that marriages are a lot of work. They're a lot of sacrifice. I would say the sacrifice would be the number one construct that's experienced. It's the key idea of marriage. And yet, many times people go to stability, right? So they look at single life as unstable and insecure, but married life as secure. So there's a lot to learn before getting married, and there's a lot to be learned during a marriage. I think that some marriages can become stable and secure over time, but it's very difficult to know that in the very beginning, right? And we kind of see that played out in this recording. They got married without necessarily kind of working everything out. And I think that, again, seems pretty evident from the tone of this conversation, regardless of what the specific expectations were that they mentioned here. Now, when Amber is confronted during the conversation, which happens many times, we see that she says she doesn't want to fight. She doesn't want to fight about the semantics. Those were her words there in the recording. This is also something pretty common we see in dysfunctional relationships. And there's this trend in the recording where we see that Depp wants to talk about something relatively straightforward and Amber's dodging it, right? She doesn't want to get into the details. She doesn't want to fight. That's her way of kind of escaping whatever it is that she was not wanting to say, which isn't immediately clear in the recording, but there's certain things she clearly did not want to discuss. It could have really been that she was worried that it was going to cause a fight, or it could have been something else that she didn't want to address. We see another point in the video where Depp says that he loved Amber, and he did use the past tense, and she catches him on this, right? Pretty detailed thing to kind of pick out. A good example of really how the conversation was moving nowhere, and this type of discussion when somebody's fighting over the word love versus loved really just makes this hard to listen to. This recording is kind of painful to go through. Then we see confessions of physical violence, right? We see Amber admits to throwing pots. And then this whole thing about hitting Johnny Depp with a closed hand, otherwise known as a fist. She indicates that she did not punch him. She hit him. So she makes a distinction when striking somebody with a fist between the word punch and hit. And then she is mad at Depp for complaining about being hit, referring to him as a baby. So again, just insulting and demeaning him. So in essence, kind of saying he wasn't tough enough to endure her repeated physical attacks, right? So kind of looking at it from distance, that seems like a very odd thing to say. But in the moment, she says that. It seems natural, like something that she doesn't really have many qualms about, right? She just puts it right out there. And I think that's as alarming as the statement itself, how casually she says that and then insults him. She knew that she was being recorded because she was the one doing the recording. Kind of an interesting exchange there. So this whole section where they're discussing the physical violence, again, it's horrible. And it's not just the confession, but also the many insults that she hurls after that confession and really throughout the whole thing. Now, a side note here, I just wanted to point out, we see Xanax brought up, the prescription medication Xanax, and also later we hear about Ambien. That was later on in the recording. Nothing can be concluded from these statements. I don't think they really necessarily mean anything, but I just thought it was interesting, right? You have this relatively short recording. It was about 45 minutes or so, and we see both Xanax and Ambien brought up. Just something that stood out to me. Then we see the statement by Amber, we're not allowed to fight anymore. And this was another theme we see repeatedly throughout the recording. It's another one of those statements that just kind of makes you cringe when you hear it because it's so indicative of dysfunction. But again, it's said like it's just a matter of fact, like everybody should accept that logic. I used to be able to be aggressive and now you're preventing that and somehow I'm the victim from that. Right. It's not a smart presentation. And it, of course, is indicative of dysfunction. Then we see this other statement. I can't blame myself for going to the finish line. And she doesn't really spell it out necessarily, but it's pretty clear the finish line is an extreme level of agitation that perhaps includes physical assault. So we don't really see any type of apology here. She's saying she can't blame herself. She can't hold herself 
accountable. And in a sense, maybe really saying she can't blame herself for her own nature. Again, a major theme in the recording. She is one particular way, and that particular way is aggressive. And if somebody tries to stop her from being aggressive, that's an invalidation of her feelings. That's not right somehow. Another way you could look at it, I'm not going to apologize for who I am or what I do because my feelings justify my actions. Not common sense, not reason, not logic, but feelings. Again, this is extremely common in dysfunctional relationships. Then we see that Depp comes up with a fairly well thought out statement. He wants Amber to say things nicely, right? Not exactly deep or profound, but I thought it was reasonable. I thought he made a good point here. Although one could argue that the whole conversation is ridiculous and exiting the conversation immediately would have been the smartest route. But either way, in the context of the conversation, if it was necessary, I think this is a good point. People can say things nicely, even if those things are disagreeable, even if those things can be somewhat hurtful. It's less antagonistic to say something in a polite way. He also said here, if things get physical, we have to separate. And Amber says, no, we don't. I found that interesting. That was a short exchange. Of course, we see kind of some other components brought up that were similar to that. But that specific exchange was short, and I thought that was revealing. No, we don't. She immediately comes back. She doesn't like the idea that when they're arguing, that he moves away from that argument, that he goes into another room or goes somewhere else. So here again, we see Depp makes another good point, and Amber seems to be the one kind of on the wrong side of logic. Now, it's worth noting here that neither one of them extends this to its logical conclusion, which is if things get physical and we have to separate, and we have to do this many times, separating altogether may make more sense. But eventually the couple does get there. Evidently, about two years after the recording was made, they were divorced, and they were separated prior to that. So they managed to get to a place where that logic was fulfilled. They just couldn't say it in that particular conversation. And that brings me to an ironic set of statements made at the end of the recording. They promised each other they will not get divorced. So that didn't work out too well. Now, some people have noted that they're surprised this relationship lasted any amount of time after this recording. I'm not surprised at all, not even a little bit. This relationship could have gone on forever, right? Dysfunctional relationships can go on. It may have been better for them to not be together. Of course, that's up to them to decide, and evidently they decide that way. But yes, a dysfunctional relationship can go on, and I've seen people be terrible to each other, much worse than what we see in this recording, and they're still married even now, years after I saw them. So little surprises me when it comes to romantic relationships and dysfunction. So what are my thoughts about this recording? As I mentioned before, it appears that they both knew that they were being recorded as it was happening. Depp seemed to be the one who was calm and perhaps more carefully considering his word choices. Amber seemed to be more agitated. I don't remember Depp making any dramatic admission against interest. I don't recall him confessing to anything. At the same time, there's nothing exculpatory either, right? I don't remember a time where Amber says that Depp never did anything bad to her, never assaulted her. So we have kind of a lack of inculpatory statements and a lack of exculpatory statements on the part of Depp. Amber does make some statements against her own interest, inculpatory statements. She admits to throwing pots at Depp, as I mentioned, and hitting him with a closed fist, which again, she says, was not punching. Beyond her admission of physical violence, there's also the verbal aggression, demeaning and insulting him, being dominant in terms of the quantity of words and the volume of her voice. Amber speaks more in the recording, and she dictates the flow of the conversation. She does not appear to be afraid of Depp in any way. She says, again, quite a few things that tend to antagonize people during this conversation and would naturally antagonize Depp somewhat, I would think. But just because she wasn't afraid in this context doesn't mean she wasn't afraid before this or after this. Now, what we see here appears to be a destructive exchange, and it's gained attention because of the two celebrities involved, of course, but I've really heard many exchanges like this, again, working with couples. It leaves you with the sense that no progress is being made, and the communication style itself is so dysfunctional that it really yields no value. It's just a waste of time. Like spinning wheels in the mud. Yes, the wheel is spinning, but you're not going to go anywhere. Another important note here, I find it interesting that 
Amber recorded herself confessing to crimes, right? That just doesn't seem like a smart move. When I first heard about the recording, I thought, well, surely this must have been recorded in secret, right? Nobody would just record themselves admitting to crimes, but evidently she did. Now, of course, what makes this particular recording stand out is that Amber writes an op-ed in the Washington Post that was published in 2018, in late 2018. This was after the divorce was finalized. And in this piece, she claims to be the victim of physical and emotional abuse. She doesn't name Johnny Depp specifically, but it seems pretty clear who she's talking about. In response to this op-ed, we see that Depp files a $50 million defamation suit. So this brings us to an interesting point. Amber says that she was harmed by Depp. There's nothing in the recording that expressly indicates that this is or is not true. What the recording does indicate is that Amber was at some point the aggressor in that relationship. And of course, this doesn't look good for her position. We also see that many people supported Amber in her accusations, moving ahead of where the evidence positioned that accusation, which is a common occurrence when there's an unexpected and high profile allegation of violence in relationship. So we don't know for sure if Amber was a victim, but we do know that she was an aggressor, and we know she left that out of her op-ed in the Washington Post. I think many people view this recording as proof that Johnny Depp is not guilty of anything wrong, right? So the pendulum tends to swing that way, like back and forth to the extremes. So at first, many people believed Amber after she made the allegation, and now that we see that it doesn't appear that she was really completely truthful, now the pendulum swings all the way over, and we see a lot of people saying, well, Johnny Depp was the victim, and surely he didn't do anything wrong. But I think this is also moving ahead of the evidence. All we really know for sure is that there are two people arguing on a recording, and that Amber admits to violence. We don't really know more than that. We don't know the rest of the story. We don't know if there's other recordings or other evidence that would indicate that perhaps they were both violent. There's just no way to know how this will all turn out. So... I think this is, again, the tendency. When one new piece of information comes out, many people kind of run way ahead of the position that that evidence supports. So they're driving so far ahead of the evidence, they lose the evidence in the rearview mirror, right? They just speed off when they hear these things. So I think it's important just to look at this information for what it is, for what it actually indicates. It is evidence, but it doesn't support all conclusions. It only supports specific, narrow conclusions. Now, another thing we see in this case is this idea that this type of aggression must be rare. I've heard this a few times, that women are rarely involved in intimate partner violence as an aggressor. I think this argument is made to justify the support that was thrown behind Amber when she made the allegation. Like statistically, it's a smart move to make. The probability that she was ever the aggressor was pretty low. Well, a few things here. First, that's not how the system works. We don't look at an allegation and say, well, statistically, it seems likely or unlikely. Therefore, let's draw a conclusion before the evidence is presented. Second, regarding the idea that women can never be aggressors in relationships, I would say that aggression is actually fairly common in both directions in relationships. And maybe some of the good that comes out of this recording is that people might be able to see that a little more clearly. This doesn't invalidate the idea that some people are victims. It invalidates the idea that some people can never be aggressive. Now, the one last theory that I'll address here in this video is this idea that Amber's insecurity drove her aggression. Now, this could be the case, but there's really not enough information in this recording to speculate about that. Yes, there appeared to be a degree of insecurity. She mentions that in the recording. And there appeared to be a degree of difficulty controlling anger. That was clearly mentioned. But that doesn't automatically point to some wider problem. That doesn't necessarily link the insecurity with the anger. I realize that she actually does make the link in the recording, right? She more or less says that her insecurity is creating a situation where she feels like she has to lash out. But I think it's important to remember that at the time this was recorded, Amber was around 28 years old and Depp was around 51 years old. So it wouldn't surprise me that Amber would be somewhat immature compared to Depp. And immaturity could explain this too. Right? It's not necessarily a link between, again, insecurity and anger. That's a possibility. Immaturity is a possibility. And of course, both of those things could be happening. It's not unusual for actors to be somewhat immature when money, 
fame and power are combined with youth, it's not a recipe for great decision making, right? We've seen this repeatedly. Now, the reason I bring this up and kind of offer this idea there could be some alternate explanation other than the insecurity anger link is because it's not unusual for somebody to use insecurity as an excuse to be angry when it's really about control. Now, we don't know if that was happening either, but I think sometimes the insecurity angle is kind of a softer place to land, right? It seems more innocent to say, well, I feel insecure. That's why I lashed out anger. People aren't going to say something like, I want to control you. That's why I lashed out in anger. So it's not that the insecurity anger link is something that never happens. That's actually quite common. It's just we have to be careful because there could be more nefarious reasons for somebody being angry. And every anger outburst isn't necessarily precipitated by the same factors. Many things can cause anger, even if that anger seems similar from instance to instance. Sometimes it could be immaturity. Sometimes it could be substances. Sometimes insecurity. Sometimes control. Sometimes just a need to be sadistic, right? There's just a lot of motivations behind anger. So we wouldn't want to look at every angry situation and say, well, it's always this one circumstance that led to it. So those are my thoughts on this particular recording and some of the fallout from the recording. I know whenever I talk about topics like celebrities having dysfunctional relationships, there's going to be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.